continuing with our Stranger Thing message series, and it's, it's a series that's based off of the book of Acts, because in Acts, there's just all kinds of crazy things that go on. Um, and we're not going to be looking at all of the crazy things in the book of Acts. We're just only going to be looking at some of them. Uh, but we started this uh, a few weeks ago, and we talked about this concept of casting lots. And we talked about how when the disciples, it was time to replace Judas, they casted lots to try to figure out who the replacement should be. And it was a really kind of strange thing on how they allowed God to guide and direct that. Then the next Sunday was Easter. And, and in, in Acts 1, uh, we have the account of Jesus' resurrection. And so as Jesus ascends to the sky is certainly a stranger thing. You get to Acts 2, and, and, and it's the story of Pentecost, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's going to be a whole bunch of other stranger things that go on throughout the book of Acts, but they're going on because of that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so I kind of had my list of what I was going to talk about, um, but I'm like, I, I wanted to just start, you know, flipping through to make sure I didn't overlook something I wanted to talk on. And, and I get to Acts 3, and right away, you know, you got Pentecost and Acts 2, but there's a strange thing happens in Acts 3, and, and it wasn't in my original kind of notes of something to cover, but I decided to preach on it this week anyways, um, because it's kind of significant. Um, it, it's the first account that we have of a disciple doing a healing. Now, that doesn't mean that the disciples hadn't done healings before. In fact, Scripture seems to indicate that they did. We just don't hear about it in the Gospels. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And it says, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. Now, in the Gospels, we do hear of the, the disciples driving out demons successfully and unsuccessfully as they came to Jesus one time saying, listen, we're trying to drive out demons and it didn't work. And, and Jesus is like, it's a difficult one. That one only comes with prayer. And so we have record of them doing that, but the Gospels don't speak about them going and, and healing and, and curing diseases and so forth. And it's not that they didn't. Uh, Matthew 10 says, Jesus sends the 12 out to do this very thing. But you got to remember the Gospels are about Jesus, right? And it's not about the disciples. So we're hear hearing the healing that Jesus does, uh, and we're not hearing the, the healing that, uh, that probably the disciples were doing. But once Jesus ascends into heaven, now this is where we're going to start hearing about the healing of the disciples. But here's what's interesting. The Gospels are about the healing of Jesus, and when you get outside of the Gospels, guess what? It's still about the healing of Jesus. All right, so uh, let, let's kind of take a look at our text for today, uh, Acts chapter 3, the strange event, the very first miraculous event that's recorded in Scripture after uh, the time of Pentecost. And it says this, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, which was at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple court. So, like, it's rush hour for the temple, right? It's when people are coming to pray, so let's bring the paralytic to come and to, to beg, right? It, no different than what you might see at rush hour, you know, on roads and outside businesses and stuff like that. That's what's going on. So, now, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, and so did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his full attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have I give you. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking them by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles become strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Now, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is certainly a stranger thing 
type passage. This isn't someone that somehow like became paralyzed three months earlier or six months earlier. This is someone who from birth, and he's an adult, he, he never once walked. So his muscle development's not there. His coordination's not there. His you know, leg strength wouldn't be there. And, 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 and they had been seeing him out there. Who knows how long they were carrying him to the temple gates. Maybe for months, but probably for year after year after year out there begging because that's the only way he was able to, to survive as he wasn't able to, to work and make his own money. And so but the people were very familiar with this individual. And, and suddenly this person who's never like developed balance, never any kind of muscle tone or coordination. I mean, uh, he gets touched by Peter and like he, he, he not only walks, he's jumping, right? Certainly a crazy thing. And, and when I read this, and, and, and part of the reason why I stopped on this story rather than moving on to some of the future ones is, I'm like, you know, what is the significance anyways that, like, that you have the power of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in, in the first miracles of healing? And, and I got to thinking, you know what, that, that, that's pretty much exactly how God worked through Jesus. When God came into this earth through his son, um, many of Jesus' miracles were, were healing. And what's interesting is that it's the healing of Jesus um, that, that, that gives validity to the message of Jesus and who he was. Let me say that again. It was the healing of Jesus that gave the validity to, to really who Jesus was. I mean, yeah, Jesus was a wise person. Uh, he was able to really understand the scriptures and so forth. But, but the fact that he was able to do these miraculous healings uh, that no one else could do uh, allowed people to understand this is someone special. This is not just a really good teacher. This is someone who, who has the power of God in them. In fact, Jesus is having a conversation with this one individual that wants to be healed and Jesus says I'll tell you what your sins are forgiven and, and the initial reaction is the Jews are kind of mocking him and making fun of him because I can sit there we can all sit there your sins are forgiven your sins are forgiven how do you know I mean you don't know you can, you can just say it like there, there's no proof and so they're mocking Jesus for it and Jesus says which is harder to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk now, Jesus' point is it's way harder to say your sins are forgiven, but he says this, so that you know that the Son of Man has the, the power and the authority to do the harder thing, to do the greater thing, he tells to that lame person, get up and walk, and they walk. So it's the miracles of Jesus, his healing, really, that enables people to understand that, that he's got the power of God in him, and it gives validity to the message. So now we have not, not God coming through his son, but God coming through his Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Jesus has now ascended into heaven, but now we're, we're seeing that there's validity in the, in the teachings and the message of the apostles because they possess this power that Jesus did to heal, and that power gives validity to the message. Now, what's interesting is the response to the message, or I'm sorry, to the healing. Um, and I want to I want to touch on this because I, I the, in my heart, this is like a problem that we have. I think within uh, very religious people, I think it's a problem what we have in in, in um, really kind of conservative Bible believing Christians, more devout people. Is I think the danger is is like when we see God work, and specifically when God works through us. I think the danger is, is we can get ourselves confused with God. And, 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 and that's not what Peter does, and I want to point this out to you. Look at Acts 3, 11 to 16. So just after this healing, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished, and they came running to them in a place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites... Why does this surprise you anyways? Why, why are you staring at us, me and John, as if by our own power or godliness we've made this man walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified your servant Jesus. You, though, handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. Though Pilate had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and the righteous one. In fact, you asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We're witnesses to this. 
By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. You see, they all knew this person. They recognized this person for, for months and certainly years and years and years. But, but all of a sudden, this person's healed. And, and, and their natural reaction is the same as what it was to Jesus when he healed. People looked at Jesus like, wow. And, and, and people would begin to worship him like a God. He, like a God. He is God, right? That, that's the, the, the natural reaction. And that's kind of like when Peter does this. They're like, wow, who is this? And 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 and. and, and they're starting to get like really impressed. And notice what Peter doesn't say. Peter doesn't say, yeah, I spent a lot of time with Jesus. Um, I, I, I've, I've developed a very strong faith. Um, I, I kind of walked on water once. He, you don't hear anything that Peter says is an I. His response to them like looking at him and being wild with him is void of anything having to do with him. Look at what he says. He says, fellow Israelites, why does it surprise you? Why do you stare at John and I like it's by our own power or it's that it's by our godliness that we have made this man walk? He says, it's Jesus' name that does it. And it's the faith that comes through him that is completely healed. There's nothing in that statement that has anything to do about him. He simply backs them off of this, this like admiring him for, for what it looks like he's done. And he says, it wasn't me. It was Jesus. And that's why I said the gospels are about Jesus healing. But guess what? So, so are the books after the gospels. We're, we're after Jesus ascends to heaven, but it's still about the fact that Jesus does it. But I think the danger is, is when God works through us, we can sometimes, once again, confuse ourselves with God. Every summer, for many years, we took a group of 40 to 60 elementary age kids up to Collin County Adventure Camp, and uh, they would get to spend a week at a camp up there and do different activities. And one of the activities that we would always do was to, for them to go fishing. And so uh, they, we'd have to break them up into groups of, you know, maybe 15 or 20 or whatever, bring them on the dock, and, uh, and uh, they would fish with hot dogs and w with, with poles. And, you know, you sit there, and most of the time it's just like sunfish that would they catch. And occasionally it would be like a bass or a catfish or something like that. But inevitably, like... Not, not all the kids have ever fished before, and, and some didn't know how, and, 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 and some just were not good at it at all, right? And that's where I kind of like came in, because everyone knew that I liked to fish, so that was kind of my activity that I would run. And, um, and they would only maybe have like 30 minutes or whatever to fish, and, and, and so about 15 minutes into it, there would be the group of people, kids, uh, that have caught their fish, and they're all excited. I, you know, caught two, three, four different fish, and then there'd be like the four or five uh, that, that just hand caught any, and they're, they're kind of sad and they're deflated. And so then I would go to them one by one and I'd say, hey, let me see your pole. And, and I'd have a hot dog and I'd try to grab a firmer, you know, piece of hot dog that can be ripped off really easy. I'd put, try to put it, uh, you know, on the tip of, uh, of the hook so that the, the fish would be forced to bite, you know, wh wh where the tip of the hook is, where the pointy part is. Um, and, and then I might say, hey, why don't you come over here and I, I, let's try it over here. And I'd be like, all right, hold on to the end of the pole. And, 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 and then I would have my hand like half way up on the pole and when, when the, the fish would, would, would tug then I would set the hook I'd be like oh look you caught one reel it in and it, they would reel it in and they'd bring it in and the fish is flopping and they don't know what to do with that and I'd grab the fish I'd take it off I'd like you want to kiss it you want to hold it you know what and, and, and then we'd throw it back and their immediate response to their friends I caught a fish and when their parents picked them up on Friday guess what mom dad I, I caught a fish well no you didn't I did right but they thought they did. And this is what happens, I think, sometimes, is it's very easy for us to confuse ourselves with God at times and to take credit for things that ultimately God is doing. Peter doesn't do that. The healing took place through the words that he said, but it was never about him. He pointed directly to Jesus. You know, I think I talked about it last week that I think sometimes we confuse God with ourselves when it comes to um, having faith. 
you know, we'll like to say things like, well, I, I came to faith, uh, you know, when I was so-and-so and, and I decided to follow Jesus or all these different things. But, but we look from scripture that that's not something that you do. That the scripture is very clear that no one, can, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The reason that you have faith is not because of something that you've done, but God's given it to you. In the same way that your child, your children, have, they didn't choose you. We don't choose God. He chooses us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. We respond to it. We think we're the ones doing it, but, but he's the one hooking the fish, right? He's the one doing the work, but sometimes we like to take the credit. The same thing, like, you'll, you'll hear people like, once again, this, this, is the, this is the danger of, I think, the more religious ones amongst us that we confuse ourselves with God, but, but when people, like, people think they kind of brought some to Christ, and, and, and what you hear him say is, well, I've been meeting with them for a long time. Um, I, I, I would tell them about these stories about myself, and I would this, and you hear all these eyes, eyes, eyes. Guess what? That person can't say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You're not the one who brought them to faith. Like, God's brought them to faith, Right? Just like Peter's not the one that healed, uh, God's the one who did it. And okay, maybe some of you have experienced healing. I think people who, who've got that gift were, were maybe they're able to heal or at times God has healed through them. It, it, it's, it's very easy to not talk like Peter. And, and for someone to say, yeah, I, I have that gift of healing and, and, and I, I've healed a person in this situation and, and I've done this. Peter doesn't say I anywhere in here. It's all about Jesus. And I have to tell you, like, I've experienced the power of God healing personally in my family and also within members, um, sometimes through maybe what appears to be direct actions of my own or maybe even through direct actions of others. But I've had several times for people to come up to me and say things like, um, thank you so much for praying for, 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 for me for this or for my loved one or for whatever. Uh, God answered it and, and they come thanking me like somehow I did it. And my response is always the same. Stop Stop thanking me. I just prayed, and I don't know who else was praying, but thank God because, like, he's the one that did it. But once again, I think it's very easy for us to confuse ourselves in the story. I know a number of pastors who kind of confuse themselves with God. And I know some well-intended, like, really devout Christians who sometimes I think the danger is they can confuse themselves with God. Let me give you another example of just how it works. You know, you're probably familiar with that story in the Bible. When Jesus was calling his disciples, um, he went to some people that were fishing, and they had fished all night. And they didn't catch one fish the whole night. And, and it's early in the morning because they fish all night. Early in the morning, they're washing their nets. And Jesus comes by the, the, the lake shore and he says, hey, do me a favor. You didn't catch anything? Go back out, just, just right up there, not very far. Throw your nets on, on, on the other side of the boat and, uh, and see what happens. And, and they're like, listen, we fished all night. We didn't catch anything. He's just, do me a favor, do it. And so they go and do it. They throw the, the net over. And when they go to lift it off, there's so much fish that the boat was about to sink. Do you think that they thought that they did that? No. I mean, they're the ones that threw the net. They're the ones that had to pick it up, but Jesus did it. And sometimes when we're throwing the net, we're picking up when God's using us, we confuse ourselves with God. Guess what? It's not about you. It's about God. We got to be careful not to take credit for what God does. For the remainder of our time this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about the beggar in the story, and I want to talk to you a little bit about Peter. Because when I read this story, I'm like, you know what? Sometimes we're the beggar, and sometimes we're like Peter. And, and let's start with, with the beggar. I think the, the, the beggar story is interesting. The beggar's asking for money, but he gets healed. And, and when I look at the story of the beggar, I'm thinking, you know what? He's asking for the lesser thing. Why is he asking for money when he could have received healing? But let's be honest and let's be fair. If you were born lame, never able to walk, and now you're a grown adult, at some point you probably would give up asking for that, right? But you would think at the very least, certainly if you knew who Peter and John were, but anyone else, hey, could you pray for my healing? And if you don't mind, spare me some change. You would think maybe he would think or say that, but he's satisfied asking for the lesser thing. Now, God gives him the greater thing, even though he's asking for the lesser thing, but I can't help but wonder. 
How many times are we like the beggar and we just ask for the lesser things? We settle when that's not what God's desire is for us. You know, as I was thinking through that whole concept, there, uh, Jesus' brother James says something in, in the scripture that I thought is very relevant to, to, to kind of that point. And it comes from James 4, the second part of verse 2 to 3. And it says this, you do not have because you do not ask. I want you to think about that for a second. You do not have because you do not ask. Now, I I can't help. I mean, that's all my point is, and I want to talk about that for a little bit longer. But I I have to say the next part. It's a whole other sermon. But it says, when you do ask, you do not receive because you're asking with the wrong motives that you may squander it on your pleasures. (laughs) So the reason we don't have is either we don't ask or we're asking for the wrong motives. But I want to specifically talk a little bit about the fact that, that like the beggar, right, he's just asking for money. And guess what? He, he's, he's, he's lame from birth into adulthood. How oftentimes do we not have? Because we just don't ask. How many of us in here are settling for, for lesser things when, when maybe, maybe God would have something greater in mind for us if we would just simply ask. How many of you are living a life of mediocrity right now? Getting up and doing the same thing over and over, not finding a lot of purpose and a lot, not a lot of meaning in your life, maybe even struggling with some mild depression as a result of it. Have you ever asked God to lift you out of mediocrity? And if you haven't, why haven't you? And I hear James' words being called out. Well, you, you continue to live a life of mediocrity because you don't ask for something different. God, lift me out of this meaningless life of mediocrity. Show me so, you know, something greater. Show me something better. You don't have because you don't ask. How about our addictions? How many of us are addicted to eating? But, but, but we just continue in that addiction, but we, we don't ask God to lift us out of that addiction to eating. Or what about our addictions to drugs or alcohol, right? I mean, we battle with it. We wish we would do better, but we don't ask God, God just somehow like lift me out of that. Help me to find my way. Surround me with the people who can help me. By divine miraculous means whatever it takes. How about for your lost addictions? How many of us are, you know, praying about that? You know, Lord, lift me out of that addiction. What about your spending addictions? And so as we have all of these addictions in our lives, uh, maybe we're stuck in them because we don't ask that God would lift us out of it. How about our dysfunctional relationships? I mean, how many of us every morning we're going to wake up and, and we know it's dysfunctional and we know it's messed up and, and we hope that every day is better, but that's all we do is we just hope, we just wish, but we don't ever like cry out to God and say, God, somehow help rescue me from my dysfunctional life. Help me to become more functional. Put someone in my life. Give me the resources. Do whatever it takes, but you don't have because you don't ask. Hey. And how about our health limitations? I think this is a big one that sometimes we're afraid to pray for because we're afraid that, well, what if God doesn't answer? And we don't have because we don't ask. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. I know this is a tough one and it's a tricky one. I've alluded to before, like in my life, I've personally experienced, um, for me personally, I've I've experienced prayers for family members and, and, and for congregational members where I know God has heard a prayer and answered a prayer in a very miraculous way. I've seen it and I've experienced it and, and, and it's amazing when he does. Now, does it always work out that way? No. There's a pa- as a pastor, I've prayed for many people, many people, and, 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 and as fervently as I know how or can, and, and it just doesn't happen. I, I, I don't know. But in the end, I surrender myself to the Lord's prayer, which is not my will. You know, your kingdom come and your will be done. I surrender myself to, to, to the sovereignty of God, but it won't stop me from asking. And if we're not willing to ask, maybe that's why we don't have. You know, Jesus talks a little bit about that because I, I think sometimes maybe Maybe we're afraid to ask, or maybe we just ask once or twice. But, you know, part of asking God, you know, for whatever it is, 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 is that you constantly ask and you persistently ask. Um, the Bible's got the story of this persistent widow 
who, who comes before the king and, and is asking the king for something. And he's like, no. But she, every day, she's like there, you know, requesting it again and again. And the king finally says, just give her what she asked. Otherwise, she's going to wear me out in her coming. We've all had that situation with our kids before, haven't we? We've all had that situation. Our kids come up to us and say, mom, dad, can I have this? And we're like, no. And then like they ask an hour later, no. And, and they keep asking. And after seven or eight times, we realize it means way more to them than it does to us. It's like, fine, just go ahead. Right? If we, being imperfect, you know, do that, how much more our Heavenly Father? So, so sometimes we don't have because we don't ask. And, and listen, the guy was, was a paralytic for his entire life. But you just don't stop asking. Sometimes... We're a little bit like the beggar, and we just settle for the lesser things. But you know what? Sometimes I think we have the opportunity to be like Peter. It doesn't seem like we do because Peter just seems to be another level. And let me say this about Peter. I'm personally angered and annoyed at the number of people that just knock Peter. I'm a huge Paul fan, but in many respects, you know, Peter's... Peter's an amazing person of, of faith. You know, people talk about Paul's faith. Guess what? Paul wasn't believing in Jesus when Jesus was alive. The disciples are figuring this out in real time, right? It, Paul ends up hearing God talk to him from heaven. Well, that's a little bit of a no-brainer. But, but, but Peter is like eating, drinking, sleeping with, with God, and that's all kind of confusing, and he's trying to figure out. Listen, Peter's the only one other than Jesus himself who's walked on water. You're like, yeah, but he's saying, great, how many times have you walked on water? How many steps have you taken? Paul didn't walk on water. Jesus is the only one. So listen, when you can do more than two or three steps on water, then maybe I won't think as highly of Peter's faith. But Peter has amazing faith. That's why what's cool is when we see the first like miraculous event of healing of, of, of the disciples in Scripture, it's Peter who does it because he has a very profound faith. Let me tell you how profound his faith is. Who is crazy enough that when you're walking into the store, you're walking into the temple in their situation, a beggar says, give me some money. He looks at him and says, sorry, I don't have any money, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk to a man who he, know, he would have known has been paralyzed from birth. If that doesn't work out well, Peter's no longer running the disciples. If that doesn't work out well, he doesn't have a following. But without hesitation, he, tur- he looks at the person and says, get up and walk, and he fully expected he walked. That's crazy, Faith, and there's not one of us in here who would have had the courage to do that. Peter's got the faith of Mark eleven twenty two 22 to 24, where Jesus says this. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea, And if they don't doubt it in their heart, but if they believe what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. That is the crazy faith of Peter. And people wanted to be impressed with Peter for that. And what does Peter do? He points them straight to God. It's not about me. It's never about me. In fact, that's why we're told to do good works, right? Because it's in our good works that those are our opportunities to point people to God. Look at what scripture says, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Listen, Peter, Peter didn't have a good work. He had an amazing work. And it glorified the Father in heaven. We, we shouldn't look at the story and say, you know what, if I, if I don't have this ability to crazy heal like, like God did through Peter, like I can't point people to God. Yeah, any of our good works, we can point people to God. I, when I look at my life, I've had some crazy encounters with God, but I don't really think through any of them that I'm aware of. Like, like I, 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 it's had the impact that, that I think, like I, I thought it might. But when I look at just like, 
those ordinary good works and good deeds that we can all do, that's like the crazy thing is somehow God works in those. And I'm about to tell you three or four stories that go against my just my grain of a person of, of never wanting to like somehow say, you know, look at me or promote myself. I'm only doing this because what I want you to do is I want you to see that you don't have to be able to heal people. I mean, at times, at times God may allow us to do that and work through us in that way, but it's through those ordinary things that God seems to work in crazy ways that we don't even begin to understand because he's the one that's doing the work. One of the ones that stand out for me is when uh, several years ago I had gone to the grocery store and I, I think it was Sam's, I'm 90% sure it was Sam's, but I don't know, maybe it was Kroger, but um, I think it was Sam's, but I remember like them over the loudspeaker saying, um, our systems are down, we're not able to take credit cards, and so it's cash only. And I remember as I'm pushing my cart through the store, I'm thinking, yeah, some people aren't listening to this and they're gonna be really surprised when they check out. And so as I went to check out, there's this mom with her young kid and, and, and they did not look like they necessarily had money and she tried to pay for her groceries through her card and, and, and the lady's like I'm sorry our card reader's down we're only taking cash and you saw that terrified look on her face and, and her little kid sitting there already opening like a package of cookies and, and sitting there eating them and stuff like that and I just tend to always kind of have cash in my wallet and, and I said and it wasn't a lot it was only like 60 or 80 dollars I'm like um, don't worry about it I, you know I'll pay for it and she was like she's so incredibly thankful that I would do that and, and, and like made me uncomfortable comfortable and I'm like and don't thank me you know God's doing this for you listen I'm a pastor of the church right and and, and I need you to know that God loves you and he's he, he's providing for you and your family like right I mean I might have been the one giving the money but I, it's like don't look at me and don't thank me frankly I'd rather keep my money myself right thank God and listen, when good works, you don't necessarily, I didn't have to heal her son. She was just incredibly thankful, hopefully to God, because of that. I've shared with you that, like, there's been times where I've, you know, prayed for people, and people identify that it's my prayers that, that God worked through in order to bring healing. And, and listen, in terms of a good work, I mean, we can all pray and, 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 and I, my answer is, is, don't thank me. Thank God. He, he, he's the one that, that, that did it. I, I had a crazy uh, conversation like three months ago um, or so. I always text visitors when they, when they come to the church. And this one guy that I had texted, texted said, um, yeah, I would like a call if you get a chance. So I called him and, and we talked. And, and he asked me a weird question. He's like, did you used to live on the other side of 35? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I used to live over there. And, and then he said, did you used to drive, you know, this color car? And now I'm trying to, like, remember back then. And now I'm getting a little nervous. Because I know how I drive. And uh, this conversation, and I kid you not, I, I kind of wanted to lie. I didn't lie. But I was very much trying to dissuade him from that was me. And then he's like, no, no. He's like, uh, you're the one, the pastor, who started the church in your house over there, right? All right, it was me. What did I do? He's like, about that, remember that ice storm we had like seven, eight years ago? And I'm trying to think. Uh, and it would have been, probably had been at least 10 years ago because um, I've been uh, moved away from there 10 years ago. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, they all kind of run together, but yeah. He's like, well, my, uh, my uh, car had uh, broken down and, and it was icy and, uh, and, and I was walking, I was walking across the bridge and just as I started to pray that like God might send someone to give me a ride, you pulled up and said, um, hey, can, you know, can I give you a ride where you live? And, and he said, you know, in, in that time when you're driving to me to your house, you said that you also lived in the subdivision, you started the church and, and he's telling me all this stuff. And, and like at first, like as he's saying it, I, I didn't even really remember it, but the more he said it, I'm like, oh yeah, I do vaguely remember that, right? But, but, but it's like, I'm, listen, I'm, I don't even hardly remember it. I'm just giving a guy a ride home in ice. But somehow, like in that, now like 10 years later, he's showing up at the church because his girlfriend has started going here. And like, he remembers what I look like from a seven-minute car ride 10 years ago. I can't even remember it happened, but he remembers my face, right? And, and that's where like through the good works and through the ordinary, like God is, is praise and glory comes to, to him. And this is the last one. And once again, I'm just, I'm sharing these things because I, I need you to understand. Listen, God might at times do miraculous things through us, but it's, it's through the ordinary that God, at least in my experience, seems to work. But I had a, about seven years ago, a, a crazy conversation. I, I got this email from this guy, um, 
Um, and, and he said, I just, I want to thank you. Um, and I'm sending you a recording of the first sermon I preached at, at my church. And I became a pastor really because of you. Now, I, I don't, I didn't even really remember this guy either. But, but as he kind of described how it all went, this was like a salesman that, you know, over three or four years, we were using his company for something. And he would on occasion come into my office to talk to me about his products. I, and I don't, I don't remember what he was selling or whatever, but, but like just from the encounters and the conversations, like he decided he was going to be a pastor. And like, I don't even really remember that either. And so my point is this, is like Peter does this great work. He does this great healing, but it's not about him. He doesn't even process it that way. He's just pointing to Jesus. You know, maybe we can on occasion do crazy great works, but many times we have the opportunity to do good works. But even in those, it's not about you. You're not necessarily going to be realizing it. Just whenever you can, point people to Jesus. What are your gifts? Do you have the gift of kindness and compassion? You know what? Through your kindness and your compassion, you have the ability to point people to Jesus and give glory to God in heaven. Do you have the gift of hospitality? Then, then use that. Use that every day so that when sometimes some, someone says, you don't realize this, but you, you kind of took me in or you gave me a meal or you did this, this, that, and, and you're like, I did. And, 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 and they're like, but you know what? Thank you so much. I, I, I totally saw God in you. Maybe, maybe you've got the gift of generosity. Maybe you've got the gift of joy. Maybe you've got the gift of a strong faith. Maybe you've got the gift of charity or service, whatever it is. Just do it and point people to God and let it never be about you. Here's what I want you to take from this stranger thing, this crazy event of Peter making God through Peter, helping this person who's never walked before to walk as an adult. The first is this, please don't confuse yourself with God, you're not. You might have pulled the net in with all those fish in there, but... God's the one who put the fish in the net. And then know that God works through ordinary people like Peter, sometimes in some crazy ways. But you know what? The Bible kind of gives us the stories of when Peter does miracles and Paul does. I'm not saying it records everyone, like of their healing and stuff like that, but the scripture doesn't seem to give us the indication that Peter was having like revivals, like Benny Hinn, and thousands of people were coming and he was thumping them in the head and, and doing mass healing events, right? It just doesn't seem to appear that way. Uh, but, but he does use Peter and Paul and the other disciples in these great and powerful ways at times, but then it's through the ordinary and it's just through the normal good works that they're constantly pointing people to Jesus. Sometimes we're going to be like the beggar and we're going to be hurt. We're going to be broken. Uh, we're going to be struggling. Sometimes we don't have because we don't ask. Ask and ask with the faith that Peter has. Don't settle and ask and keep asking. And when God gives you the opportunity to be like Peter, do the good works he's called you to do. And don't use them to point to yourself and how great you are and what you can do and what you've done and what you, you know, might do. Lives can be radically changed by the simple things that we don't even realize that we're doing, but God's called us to do it from even before the day we were born. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, we just thank you for the power of this text to be able to to see the humility in someone like Peter who has amazing faith that without fear or apprehension, he declares to this person who has no muscle tone, no balance, no anything, get up and walk, and he does. I just pray, gracious God, that you'd help us so that in faith, we would be vessels that you can use Maybe sometimes through the great and the miraculous, but so many times in the everyday ways that we don't even realize how. But as you use us, gracious God, let that never go to our head. Let us never think about how great we are or that it's about us, but help us, gracious God, to not point to ourselves, but to point to you. And gracious God, some of us in here right now are like the beggars. We're stuck in 
our sin. We're stuck in our dysfunction. We're stuck in our addictions. We're stuck in our hurt and our pain or our feeling sorry for ourselves, our depression, our despair, or whatever it is. Let us do more than just hope and wish. But let us ask. And in faith, gracious God, we come to you knowing that you, you can hear and you will answer. And we do surrender ourselves to the sovereignty of what that answer is. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.